Today we are doing the parable of the prodigal son. This is our last um, parable, our last story in the parables that we've been going through. Um, And so I want to read this one to you. This might, of all the parables that we covered, this is probably the most well-known. It's my favorite parable. The whole reason we've done this series is so that I could preach this parable. So if you have your Bibles, you can flip with me over to Luke chapter 15, and we are starting, we're going to start to read at verse 11. Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he, the older brother, was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, You killed the fattened calf for him. And the father said to him, son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is now found. This is the word of the Lord. Y'all, come on. I know we're not charismatic Pentecostal, but you can do better than that. (laughs) At least give me some Baptist volume there. All right, this like that. That's a pretty awesome passage of scripture. You're like this is the word of the Lord. Thank be to God. All right, this is the word of the Lord. Good night. Thank you. Wow, wow. I, I didn't know we'd go that strong either. All right. Well, in order to understand this parable, and, and by the way, in, in case you're just joining us today, this series on parables. I think we've done seven of them. Um, This series on parables, at the beginning, what we highlighted was Jesus' purpose for teaching in parables. The word parable means to come alongside a truth, to come alongside a statement. So it's illuminating a truth. But what's interesting to note is when Jesus spoke in parables, he intentionally did so, so that those that had eyes to see and ears to hear would receive it, but those that didn't have eyes to see or ears to hear, namely the religious rulers, the Pharisees, who we'll talk about in a minute, they'd hear these parables and they wouldn't understand them at all. They'd be like, I feel like this story is about me, but I don't really get it. It's like when one of your friends is talking about you, and you're like, I know they're talking about me, and it feels like it's something bad. I don't know what they're saying, but it's probably bad. That's what's going on with the Pharisees. So we've talked about all of these different parables. Now, what we want to do today is to set up this story. We've got to understand the context in which Jesus spoke it. To pull it away from its context, you miss the majority of its beautiful Meaning. So we need to understand what's going on. Again, Jesus is duking it out with the Pharisees. If you don't know who the Pharisees are, they're the religious Jewish leaders of the day. They're smart, they're intellectual, um, they hold the law of God highly in esteem, it, it, they esteem it high. But the problem is they've also added to it, where they have made it all about them. They have leveraged the law of God to make a kingdom for themselves. And Jesus is coming to town, and Jesus declaring the true kingdom of God is cramping their style. So they don't like Jesus. So they're trying to take Jesus out. So over and over again, they're trying to take Jesus out, and Jesus comes back to them with 
a parable. So most of the parables were in response to the Pharisees having a problem with Jesus and his disciples doing some kind of work on the Sabbath. They had a big thing with the Sabbath, and so Jesus would tell a parable that would put them in their place. They wouldn't know what hit them, and they'd be like, we don't understand it, but everybody else understood it, and then they would walk away with their tail tucked between their legs. So in this parable, it's different. It's no longer the Sabbath that they're going after Jesus. This time, they're attacking him for the company that he's keeping. They're going after him because of the people that he is hanging out with. They're like, you know, somebody who's holy, somebody who's righteous, somebody who claims to be what you claim to be would never hang out with these types of people. Did you notice what types of people he's being accused of hanging out with? Two types of people, and it's very common as we walk through the Gospels. It's the tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors and sinners. It always fascinated me that tax collectors were separated from sinners. I thought they were one and the same, okay? So when I was a kid, when I was a kid, my favorite movie was Popeye with Robin Williams, and there was a tax collector in it. So from an early age, I'm like, tax collectors are bad guys. So when we think of tax collectors, what do we immediately think of? The IRS, right? <laughs> Let me, this is just for my own homework. I, I just, my doing my due diligence here. When you get your mail and there is a letter from the Internal Revenue Service in your mail that you didn't expect to be coming, how many of you, your, your heart sinks? You're like, I, I don't, I, I know I've done nothing wrong, but I'm going to prison, right? <laughs> I, I, I am Scotty Scheffler. You might not even get that joke. Um, but, but I'm going to prison. I don't know. And then it's just them just stating, here's your annual Social Security, whatever. And you're like, oh, thank God. I've got another year before they scare me to death again. So I think of the IRS. I'm, I'm terrified by them. But is that what a tax collector is? Was, was Jesus friends with the IRS? Is that that's what's going on? No, it's not. It, it's interesting when we think about tax collectors and what they were up to back in the day and why they were so frowned upon by the Jewish people as a whole. Here's what's going on. Think about what's going on in the first century in the Middle East. The, the Rome has conquered the world, and Rome has oppressed pretty much everybody. So Rome rules the world, including the people of, uh, of Israel. So the people of Israel are under Roman oppression at this time. How do the Romans keep people under oppression? How do they hold them under their thumb? With a vast military, a huge army, right? How do you think they paid for that army? They paid for that army by taxing those people that they overthrew and then overruled and conquered. So these people are being taxed, and then these taxes are paying for their oppression. So it's kind of this circular thing, but the beauty of what Caesar was doing and, and what his government was doing was they were using the people of those nations to tax their own people, to receive the funds, to use those taxes to then further oppress those people. So in the Jewish, um, in, in Israel, what they would do is they would go to people, Jewish people, and they would hire them as tax collectors. These tax collectors would then go and collect taxes from the Jewish people, and while they were doing that, they would also up the taxes so that they could pocket a little bit of money themselves. So they were thieves. Not only that, they were oppressing their own people. So you, you can imagine if you are enslaved to a nation and your people, your own people, are helping that nation enslave you, you're not going to like those people very much. So that's what's going on with the tax collectors. Now, when you think through um, the gospel accounts and Jesus calling his disciples, um, true or false, one of Jesus' 12 disciples was one of these tax collectors. True, it's Matthew. The very first gospel of the New Testament is written by a former tax collector. And it exemplifies Jesus' grace. So we see Jesus hanging out with people like this. So tax collectors are more vile than the rest of the sinners. So the rest of the sinners, sexual sin. We got all of these other deviant sins over here and tax collectors. It's like their occupation has been set aside as its own category. And the Pharisees are looking at Jesus going, if he was really a holy man, he would never hang out with these types of of people. The, the, how could you hang out with tax collectors and sinners? Earlier, we saw a, a parable where Jesus has a banquet, and he's telling them, invite these kind of people to your banquet. And so out of this, these guys are, are questioning Jesus, why would you hang out with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus, in response, in typical notorious Jesus fashion, retorts with a story. And he actually, he doesn't just give them one story. He gives them three stories, doesn't he? If you look at Luke 15, we didn't read the entirety of Luke chapter 15 today. We just read one story. Jesus gives them a trilogy. It, it's a three-part series of stories about lost things with the story of the prodigal son being the climactic scene. It's, this is the story that everything else has been leading up to. 
The first story was the story of 100 sheep where 99 are, are found, but one sheep has gone missing. And so the shepherd goes and he leaves the 99 and he goes to find the one. Now, again, let me, as we leave the parable series, I want to reemphasize this because our temptation as we read parables is to read too much into them, to make something out of nothing, right? To make a mountain out of a molehill. So we'll look at this. My question with that story of the, the 99 found and the one lost has always been, Jesus, why would you leave the 99? Like, hey, what about the 99? And I know there's strength in the pack, but does that mean that, Jesus, when you go to find the lost person, you, you leave the rest of us? Is your presence gone? And that's reading too much into a parable. You're, you're missing the point of the parable. And we know Jesus doesn't leave his church. Revelation shows us that Jesus is in the middle of his church. That we're his people, and so he's not going to leave us. So don't read too much into it. The point is that the shepherd went to find the lost sheep. He cared enough about the lost sheep that he went after that lost sheep, of which all of us at one point in our life have been that sheep. And when he goes and finds that sheep, he finds them, he picks them up, puts them on his shoulder, carries them back to the flock, calls all his neighbors and said, party with me, celebrate me, with me. That which was lost has now been found. So we got the story of the one lost sheep. Then the next story, it's a very short story. It's only a couple sentences. There's a woman who has 10 coins and she loses one of her coins. And then when she diligently searches everywhere, she goes looking for this lost coin. She finally find, find, finds it. When she finds it, what happens? She calls her neighbor. She calls her family. Celebrate with me. That which was lost is found. And then it leads us to today's story, the story of the son or the sons plural. Okay. Now, one thing to notice in this story is that every single one of these stories escalates, doesn't it? It starts off with sheep. Who cares about sheep? They're cute, but come on. At the end of the day, we're going to cut them, and we're going we're gonna to wear their clothes, and we're going to have lamb chops for lunch, right? So the, these are sheep, and, and I want you to notice something else. There's a hundred of them, of which only one is missing. And, and by the way, whenever, there's a, whenever you see a sheep story and there's more than 15 sheep, it's a symbol that the shepherd was pretty wealthy, or the owner of the sheep was very wealthy. Anything over 15 He's got a big estate, and so this is what's going on here. This is a wealthy shepherd or a wealthy owner, and this shepherd has lost one. And so one out of 100 is, I know not all of us are very good at math, but one out of 100 is, what, what's the percentage on that? One percent, right? Calculators, we good? So it's one out of 100, one percent. So it's sheep, and it's one percent. The next story escalates. This woman only has 10 coins to her entire name. In order to survive, she needs this money. This represents her livelihood. This represents her uh, uh, ability to stay alive, survivability. She needs these coins, but she's lost one. One out of 10, 10%. So we've gone from 1% to 10%, and now, so it's sheep, coins, sons, 1%, 10%. What's the percentage here? This guy has two sons, right? And let me just kind of let the cat out of the bag. I think when we talk about this story, the emphasis is so much on the prodigal son. Prodigal meaning lavish spending, wasteful, that kind of thing. So we're looking at the story of the youngest son and saying he's lost. But the truth be told, this story is about both sons. Two for two are lost in this story. It's not just the prodigal. It's also the self-righteous elder brother in this story. So literally, we're going from 1% to 10% to 100%. And it's much more endearing because it's not a sheep and it's not a coin. It's a kid. And this matters. So it's being amped up as we go through this story. So in this story, it's really fascinating to me. This story has always fascinated me. Because in this story, there are three primary characters. There's the father, there's the youngest son, and the eldest son. The more you study, the more you unpack this story, you got to question why we as publishers, not us, you know, why the publishers did this, why we tell this story, why do we always label it the story of the prodigal son? Because I want to propose this isn't the prodigal story. I, I think just when he goes away, so much drama happens to him that we're just like, let's elevate him and let's make that story about him. But at the heart of this story, who is the main character of this story? It's the father. It's the father's compassion. It's the father's heart. And if there's a secondary character in this story, I think it's the eldest brother. Because Jesus is talking directly to the Pharisees, and they are the elder brother. They are the self-righteous ones. Now, the prodigal, this younger child, of course he plays a huge role in this. 
But this story pits Jesus' compassion against the eldest brother's anger and his self-righteousness. And that's what this parable is about. So this morning, what I want to do, I just want to walk through this story. We're not going to walk through the sheep and the lost coins. We're just going to walk through um, this story together because this story blows my mind. And the truth be told, if you've ever heard this story, or maybe you're hearing it for the first time this morning, all of us should, if we're, if we're humble enough, all of us should realize that we are one of the two brothers in this story, or we were one of the two brothers in this story at some point in our life. Like when we read these stories, we want to read ourselves into the story. Where do we belong? Who are we in this story? Well, let's just, let, let's mark one out of the way and tell you who you're not. You are not the father in this story, nor am I. Okay, we are not the, now we, we are striving to become like the father, right, in attitude and compassion, but we are not the father in this story. In this story, God, our heavenly father, is the father in this story. You and I are either the younger brother or the elder brother, and I want to propose that at some point in our life before coming to Christ, every single one of us was the younger brother, And every single one of us that has come to Christ at some point in our life have the temptation of becoming the eldest brother. Some of us find a little bit of both mixed into our DNA. So we want to walk through this and and talk about this story. So here's how it begins. It begins weird, right? So these guys notice, the Pharisees notice Jesus is hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus is like, stop, let me tell you a story. And the story begins. It's like there's there's a dad, there's a father, and he has two sons, two boys, And we're like, okay, so he's going to soft sell us. We're going to ease right into this story. Tell me about those two sons. No, instead he's going to be like, let me tell you about the youngest son's sin. Once upon a time, there's a father who has two boys. And the youngest son comes to the father and demands his share of his inheritance. I mean, that's supposed to catch you off guard. That's like, excuse me? That, that, even in 21st century American terms, that's rude, right? That's really, really, who would do that? Like if I went to my dad and went, like, dad, you know what? Um, I'd like to go live on my own. I'd like to do my own thing. And it's not even, hey, could you give me my inheritance? It says he demanded his inheritance. Give me my inheritance. So today in the 21st century, that is rude. In the first century, Middle East, that is taboo, You cannot do this. It was beyond rude. And so what we see here is a public shaming of the father. This younger son is coming out, and for whatever reason, he wants to get away from dad. The further we go into the story, the more ridiculous that becomes. Because you find out this dad is a good dad. He's compassionate. He's kind. These two boys have everything living under this man's roof. He's, he's loaded. He's got all the wealth. He loves his boys. All of this. And this kid's like, you know what? I want to go live on my own for whatever reason. Dad, you're overbearing. Dad, you're just too much. I just can't handle you, so I want to go spread my wings. I want to go fly. I want to go live on my own with your money. I mean, there's a catch in that, isn't it? It's like, I want to go do it my way with your resources. So he's like, give me all that is mine. Give me everything that is mine, which is incredibly rude and incredibly taboo. Now, for those of you guys that our youngest children in here, forgive me, this isn't my stereotype of you. This is ancient Middle Eastern stereotypes of youngest sons, not youngest children, youngest sons. So all my youngest sons, raise raise your hands for me. I think Joseph's here today. My son is not here. He dodged. So wait, keep them loud and proud, youngest sons. Wow, this is awkward for me. (laughs) I didn't realize we had so many of you. Okay, youngest sons, here's the stereotype. You, it's up to your, your parents to determine whether this was true, but um, you're selfish, you're, you're covetous, and you're rude, okay? So that, that in Middle East, all the older brothers in the room, loud amens, right? So don't worry, younger brothers, we're coming to the older ones in just a minute. There's a whole section about them, okay? But there's a Middle Eastern, first century stereotype that you're covetous, you're rude, and you're lazy, Okay, And Jesus isn't coming in and putting his stamp of approval on that, saying this is true. Jesus is coming in, and he's leaning into that stereotype to, to, to prove a point. So this is what's going on. This little brother, he demands everything that's his, and shockingly, surprisingly, the father just gives it to him. The father gives it to him. It says in, this, in, in the text we just read that immediately the father divided the inheritance Divide it. So he portioned it out. This is what the older son is to get. This is what the youngest son is to get. But he only distributes 
the inheritance to the youngest son. The older son doesn't get his share yet because he's living in it, but he distributes it to the younger son. Now, here's the interesting part, and we've talked about this before. When it comes to the rights of the estate in the father's house after the father dies, the eldest son always gets the majority of the estate, which, man, those were good old days. Those were... I'm scared right now because I don't think there's very many of us left after I saw how many younger brothers there are. O- oldest sons, oldest sons, raise your hand. There we are, my people. What's up? <laughs> Joseph, you're both. Well, you are. Yeah, you are. Your youngest brother. And yeah, that's what happens when you got an older sister. So there it is. So Jordan, my man. Okay, so now oldest sons, you're, gonna, you're getting hosed both ways. You shouldn't have raised your hand. This story's going to nail you. It's going to drill you. So the oldest son would get the majority of the inheritance, and then whatever's left over would be distributed amongst the rest of the kids. When there's only two sons, there's only one way to divide it. You get, what, 75-25, 75% to the older son, 25% to the younger son. Now, knowing that, knowing that, that the father distributes the younger son's portion, I want you to fast forward, knowing where this story is going, where he's going, this son is going to go off, spend all the money, and he's going to come back, and he's going to return. When he returns, when he returns, and he's welcomed back as a son, whose dime is covering the expenses of the younger brother? It's now the estate of the older brother. So to a degree, can we just confess, I kind of get the older brother's dilemma here. Yeah, it's like, oh, this is awkward, and all of this stuff is going on. So he demands it. The father gives him his inheritance. This is absolutely crazy. So the youngest son goes away, He wants his freedom. He wants to spread his wings. He wants to do this. And as the story continues, you find out that the father is good, and the the son just wants to go, and he goes and leaves. Now, we're going to do this three different times. Let's, Let's pan away from the story for a minute, and let's put the camera on the Pharisees for a minute as they're hearing this story. How are they feeling about this story? As they hear it up to this point, like, I know you guys have probably heard this story before. Pretend that you've never heard the story of the prodigal son. As you hear this story for the first time and you see that this son is demanding of his father, he has no legal right to do it. As a matter of fact, the father has the legal authority to kick this son out of his house just for making the request. But the father gives him what he demands. And you're a Pharisee, you're going, well, the father probably shouldn't have done that. The father looks a little bit soft by doing that. How dare, like you're mad at this son. You're mad at this son. Now, now let's zoom our cameras over to the tax collectors and sinners as they hear this story started. They're probably like, this is incredibly awkward because that's us. The story Jesus is telling is our story. Wasteful living, defiance, rebellion, this is our story. So the Pharisees are still in their comfort zone. The tax collectors and sinners are feeling incredibly uncomfortable. They have no idea where this story is going to go. Back to the story. It happens so quickly. I know it was a longer section uh, of text, but it happens very quickly. The younger brother walks away. He's got all this money, and it says he leaves for another country. As he goes to this other country, it says he spends his entire wealth on frivolous living. Now, we don't know exactly what frivolous living is until later on the elder brother describes it for us, saying he spent all of his money on prostitutes. I, I, I don't even, Wow. That, that's, that, that is a lot of frivolous living that, that you just blew an entire estate. You blew everything that you had through this. So all of this stuff is going on. He loses everything. He loses everything. So desperate is he that he now gets hired. Remember that he gets hired. He gets a, a full-time, part-time job. We don't know. Feeding pigs feeding pigs. This is where it's really fascinating for me because in the Jewish faith, what is the absolute disgrace when it comes to non-kosher food? It's pork. So you've now got this Jewish kid or Jewish young man feeding food to the most disgraced animal in the Jewish faith. In other words, he's below a pig. He's giving food to a pig. He's less than a pig. And the interesting thing, I've always grown up thinking in this pigsty, he's eating the pig's food. Like, that's how low he had gotten. That's not what the story says. The story says he had gotten to such a bad place that he longed to eat the food that the pigs were eating. He probably wasn't allowed to eat it, else he would be stealing. He was so desperate, he desired to eat the pods that the pigs were eating. He was lower than a pig. 
So the, the people listening to the story are like, oh, he, not only did he touch a pig, he's serving a pig. I'm like, what in the world is going on in all of this? So this story is absolutely insane. He couldn't get any help. It said nobody gave anything to him. The reason he couldn't get any help is because the Romans and Greeks didn't believe in any sort of generosity in terms of almsgiving. If you saw somebody on the side of the road, if you saw a homeless person, don't take care of them. Don't give them anything. They need to buckle up their bootstraps or pull up their bootstraps, get to work, right? Do not give alms or do not give any kind of generosity to anybody that's in need. Let them work for it. So this kid couldn't get any help. So here he is feeding pigs. As a Jew, and it's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence that Jesus puts pigs in this picture. He's at the lowest of lows. We might not get it because we're not Jewish. This is the biggest insult. This kid was at the bottom of the barrel. And let me just do a timeout here. Because I know some of us, our story is the story of the prodigal. And we remember that moment in our lives where we were at our lowest point. Where if something didn't change, if something didn't change, we couldn't continue. This is where this kid is. He's at the lowest of lows, and we're supposed to feel this. It's heavy. It's deep. And in verse 17, everything changes. Verse 17 is the pivot point of the story. It says this, but when he came to himself. Other version says when he, when he came to his senses. What's going on here is when he realized, and it took him getting to the bottom of the pit in order to realize where he had fallen, all of a sudden he came to himself. He's like, what am I doing? What in the world is going on with my life? So it, it, what I think happens here is he realizes two things. Number one, he realizes what he's done. So he realizes the sin in his own heart. He realizes what he's done to betray his father. But he also realizes how good he had it with his father. It's like, I, I realize what I've done, but I also realize maybe my dad wasn't as bad as I made him out to be. Maybe my dad was good and generous and kind. And in the middle of this pigsty, he realizes that. He came to himself. Have you had that moment in your own life where things got so out of control, so out of hand, you're like, how did I get here? What happened? One minute I'm having fun, one minute it's frivolous, and I've got the, the whole world just in the palm of my hands, and the next minute I've got nothing. I've lost, I've blown it. And you know it's you. You know it's you. And, and to me, I'm looking at this story, at, at this moment, it's like this is the most crushing moment, but it's the beautiful moment of the story, isn't it? It's the pivot point. It's, the, it's where the story takes a shift. Without this point in the story, nothing changes for the prodigal. Nothing changes for him. But it's in this moment of deep despair and deep pain where he's run out of every kind of hope. He's exhausted everything he knows. It's in this moment where the work of God does his greatest work. And that's the story of so many of us in this room where when we got to rock bottom, that's the only, our stubborn hearts couldn't hear God until we got to rock bottom. And once we got there, then all of a sudden we're like, what am I doing? What am I doing? And you're humbled. And all of a sudden that chip on your shoulder, that arrogance, that defiance, that pride, all of it all of a sudden dissipates because look at me, I'm in a pig pen serving pigs. What am I doing? And this is the pivot point for this younger son when he comes to himself. And immediately the story shifts again from this to an inner monologue he starts having with himself. He starts talking to himself. He's like, I had it so good. What am I thinking? You know what? I'm gonna return to my father's house and, and I'm gonna return to him and, and tell him, Father, I've, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. I don't deserve, I, I, I wanna come home, but I know, I understand. I can't come home as a son. I've blown that. I've ruined that. I don't deserve that. You can see, this is different than how he was talking at the front of the story, the beginning of the story, isn't it? It's like, I don't deserve this. So I'm gonna come back. I don't wanna be your son. I, can't, I, know, I do wanna be your son. I, can't, I know I can't be your son. I've publicly shamed you. I've caused you stress. You've probably had sleepless nights. You've probably wrestled. You've probably been angry. I don't deserve to be called your son. Make me a slave. Make me a servant. Anything's better than serving pigs. Anything's better than where I'm at right now. And so he's whipping this up in his head. Here's a beautiful thing to consider. I think once he came to his senses, one of the things we can quickly miss is that he realized where he was, but he also realized something about his father, how good he had it with his father, how loving and compassionate his father was, so much so that he's like, 
I have the confidence to actually go back to him because I believe there's a modicum of respect or, or graciousness in my father that he'll at least hear me out. He knew his father well enough that he knew it was safe to at least go back to him and talk to him. He didn't go to a neighbor. He didn't go to a distant uncle. He's like, I'm going back to my father. I'm going back to his house. I'm going back to his home. He might not make me son, but he'll at least hear me. There's something beautiful about all the cred that the, the, the credibility the father has built up over the years that when he was at his lowest point, the, father knew, or the son knew he could go back to his father. So he's having this inner monologue, and he's trying to convince himself, okay, I can go back and I can ask to be a servant. Well, check in time number two with the Pharisees. Now how are they doing? I, I think they're loving the story right now. You're in with the pigs, ha, ha, ha. Right, these are justice people, no mercy. I mean, they're Cobra Kai. Mercy is for the weak, right? And, and so the enemy deserves no mercy. So even though it's your son, you, he cut, this, this kid cut off ties as being a son. Give him what he deserves. Punish him. Pun, give him the wrath. Yeah, come home, son, come home, and let's see the thunder come down on you. This is what the Pharisees are thinking. What are the tax collectors and sinners thinking? Oh, man, we're gonna get it. Like, this kid's going to go home, and he's going to get the snot kicked out of him. Don't go home, kid. Don't go. You can't, you can't go home. That's not an option here. You Run, run. You cannot go home. This is what these guys are thinking as this happens. So the younger son is back on the road. He's walking to the father's house. You can feel him rehearsing his speech over and over again as he walks this road. For those of you guys that um, have ever had a difficult conversation, a confrontational converse, conversation, have you ever rehearsed it before that conversation happened? And then it never plays out the way that you think it's going to go, so it doesn't matter. But, but you're losing sleep, you're tense, you're nervous. I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this, so I say it right and I don't say it like a fool. Well, this is what this son says. He's, he's in, his, in his heart practicing. Maybe he's practicing out loud as he walks home. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I do not deserve to be called your son. Please take me in as a slave. And then the story just blows up. This is where the tears start. This is where the music starts playing because when the son approaches the house, he's coming humbly. You've seen the repentance in his heart. You've seen it. He's got to repent to his father still. But you see it. You feel it. You hear it. You sense it. Every, he's coming to repent. And before he gets to the father's house, the camera shifts once again and the camera shifts to the father. And the father isn't inside the house living it up the father is on, outside the house, probably on the stoop, out on the porch, and he's looking, he's watching, he's waiting, he's longing for the day when his son will return. And we have no idea how long he's been gone. But this compassionate and kind and good father isn't waiting to slaughter his son. He's waiting to welcome his son home. And I wonder sometimes how many of us as prodigals are scared to come home because we have a misguided understanding of what our father actually thinks He's going to kill me. He's going to punish me. And Jesus is like, no, this is the story of your heavenly father. He's different. He's different. And so what happens here is the heavenly father gets off the porch or whatever part of the house he is because he sees his son coming in the distance. The father leaves where he is. He leaves the 99 to go get the one. And he runs to his son. And the son is ready to say the words, Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth and before you, and, and I no longer deserve to be called your son. I'm a slave. And as he's starting to talk, the father just hugs him and kisses him. Orders his servants, go get me a robe. Go get me a ring. Go get me some shoes. Let's light up the fatted calf. Now, Pharisees, Pharisees are not okay with this. Because the story's flipped, right? It, it also, what are you doing with this story? No, 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 punish him. And this father, again, realized earlier in the story, this son has publicly shamed him. People saw this happen. And now for this son to come home publicly, the servants are watching. People are watching. He comes home again. The father, his reputation is at stake. If you allow this kid to come back, you're going to look soft. You're going to look weak. People can take advantage of you and your kindness. And the father goes against all social norms. He hugs his kid, welcomes him home, puts a robe on him, a, a robe on him as a sign. I'll make sure I get this right. As a sign of high status in his father's household. Think Joseph in the coat of many colors in the Old Testament. 
He puts a ring on him as a sign of authority. You're not a slave. You're a son. He puts shoes on his feet, meaning you belong here at home, and he orders him or orders his servants to go slaughter a fatted calf. We're going to eat. How do you think the son is receiving this? What, like, what? I, I'm just thrilled to be home. I don't care what capacity, but, but you put a robe on me. You put a ring of authority on me. You're putting shoes on me to welcome me home. You're, you're killing a calf. Do you know how hungry I am? Like, we're about to eat. We're, we're going we're gonna to eat, right? We're going to have steaks, prime rib. We're, we're going to eat well. I'm, I'm no longer longing for the pig pods. I'm going to, have you seen, what's the movie with Tom Hanks where he crashes and castaway, right? Like that flight home when he's eating, the food's all there. This must be what this son is feeling like. Like this is all coming. Now, what I want you to notice of everything that the father gives his son, he gives him a robe, he gives him a ring, he gives him shoes, and he gives him a feast. The main thing the father gave him is his position back. He calls him a son. You, you're my son. You're not a servant. You are my son. So the Pharisees, checking in on them, not doing so well. You can't do that. Your, your reputation's taking a hit. You cannot do this. Meanwhile, the tax collectors and sinners, I can only imagine what they're thinking. We don't deserve this. I, I, I've rebelled against you. I've defied you. I, I don't deserve this kind of grace. And this is what the whole New Testament is all about, right? The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And, and so they, I, you can almost imagine the tax collectors and sinners knowing that they're this brother, hearing what this father has done, hearing what their heavenly father is like, and tears welling up in their life while the Pharisees are getting angry. So Jesus is hitting two things at once. Celebration ensues. They start partying, and just like the shepherd when he found his missing sheep, just like the woman when she found her missing coin, it's time to party. Why? Because this son of mine who was lost or dead is now found and alive. Young people, if you've never been a parent before, this makes sense. This just makes sense. It's like understand the heart of the father here. You're my kid. You, you, I, the only thing that matters is that you're found and that you're alive, that you're here. Now, there's a plot twist. This is crazy. There's a plot twist. Because now the camera zooms the eldest son. And he hasn't been in the story since the very beginning. Now, all of a sudden, we're, we're brought back to the eldest son, and we see what's going on with him. He's out working in the field, and he hears commotion. He hears dancing and singing. Why is everybody so happy? He must be a guy that doesn't like fun, right? And he's like, why, is that, why are we having fun? And the servant's like, you haven't heard? Your brother who was lost is now found. He's home. And they're probably thinking, that's great news, right? And the son, being the Debbie Downer that he is, is like, no, that's not good news. Th no. Well, first of all, if he comes back, he's going to be spending my money. Second of all, no, no, no. Do, do you know what this kid has done? Do you know the turmoil he has caused our family? Do you know the pain he has brought to me and to my father? Do you know what's going on? And all of a sudden, everything changes. His anger is, is dialed up to an incredible notch when he finds out that his brother has returned. And not only has he returned, but they're throwing a party for him? They're killing a fattened calf for him? And what's, what's going on here? Just to shorten it, this entire story is supposed to compare and contrast the father's compassion and generosity versus the elder son's anger and self-righteousness. And in the middle is this prodigal son that's bounced both ways. In the first part of the story, the youngest son is defiant. He's rude. He's entirely out of order. At the end of the story, the eldest son is now defiant and rude and completely out of order. He refuses to go to this feast. What he is telling his father in this moment, as he has this confrontation with his father, and his father saying, hey, here's all the good news. Your brother's here, and, and, and his kid refuses, refuses to call his father father, and he will not call his brother brother. What he's doing is he's detaching himself from the family because he's so angry that the father would ever have compassion on the broken and the lost. So he detaches himself from the family. Think about this. The son, the prodigal son, as he's walking to the father, is rehearsing this speech. I've sinned before heaven and before you. I don't deserve to be called your son. I just want to be your servant. 
And then the father welcomes him, him in as son. The eldest son is the son, and he's pulling himself away and putting himself in the position of servant. The very thing the prodigal was praying, if I could just be your servant, the eldest son is demoting himself to that. He's pulling away from the family table. He's defiant, he's rude, and he's cutting himself off. As I said at the beginning, if I'm honest with you, to a degree, I get the attitude of the eldest son. I get it. He's walked the line. He's kept his nose clean. He, he's, he's been straight. He's done things. He's done the orders. He's done the rules. He's lived by it. And he didn't get a fattened calf. He's like, heck, I didn't even get a goat. And the father's like, son, son, what are you talking about? All of this, every bit of this is yours. So the father has a heart to heart with the eldest son trying to get him to see the big picture. He wants him to see that grace is stronger than wrath. Imagine the 99 sheep with the shepherd bringing back the one. And when he shows up with the one, imagine the other 99 going, <laughs> not cool, shepherd. Or, or the woman bringing back the one lost coin and all of a sudden coins could talk because it's a cartoon and the, the other nine coins are like, not cool, ma'am. We were good without that other coin. It's ridiculous. This is a moment of celebration. This is a moment of party. This is what Jesus is teaching. The only thing I hope to accomplish by walking through this parable, and I'm going to read some of it just so I can make it through, because the story of the prodigal son just rips me to pieces. My only thing I wanted to accomplish this morning was allow us to see what this parable is teaching us about the heart of the Father. In one way or another, or in many different ways, every single one of us can find ourselves in the character of the youngest son or the oldest son. And like I said, for some of us, we're a concoction of both. Some of you are in here this morning, right now, and maybe you're wondering why you're here. Your life's a bit upside down. You don't know where you're going. You don't know how you got here. You look back at the journey of your life, and you're like, how in the world did I get here? And you certainly don't like where you're landed, where you are, but there's pride, and you don't want to admit it. You don't want to confess that you're not where you're supposed to be. But I'm telling you, this morning, you're here by the grace, the providence, the sovereignty, the goodness of God. You're here. Listen to this. You're here because you need to know that there's a heavenly father who loves you and all he's been waiting for is for you to come home. And please hear me. Home isn't an address. It's not a place. Home is a person. You're coming home to a gracious heavenly father. Your heavenly father has been patiently waiting for you to come to your senses, to realize, oh, I've come to myself again and return home. Your life might not look like you've been in a pigsty because you're all cleaned up on the outside. You fooled others. It looks like you have it all together. Maybe there's secret sin that's gnawing away at you, a marriage that's eroded, children that are distant. You've come to rock bottom in your own life, hidden sin. And the message this morning for you is there's a gracious heavenly father who is begging you, imploring you, come home, come home. Your heavenly father loves you more than you can ever imagine and he's waiting on the front step for you to just come home. Now, others of you in here this morning have a story that looks differently than the younger son. There's a party going on in the house for the wayward son who has returned. So while the prodigal's been living it up, you've been at home, you've rolled up your sleeves, you've done the work day in, day out, constantly faithful, not a lot of attention, just doing your job but you heard that your father is throwing a party for the reckless one, the one who wasted everything, the one who upon his return is going to cut into your inheritance. And you're like, wait a minute, I've been faithful. I've done what you've asked me to. I, I've, been, I've walked the straight line. I've been straight laced. I never got a goat, much less a calf. And there's some resentment there. Frustration with your brother, but more so with your father for his compassion. And here's what I know, and I get this. Here's what I know. Some of us feel that. We just feel that because of the good life we've lived, that the rewards should be streaming in. God owes me. Because of how I've lived, my kids should be walking with the Lord. 
The good life I've lived and the decisions I've made should result in me getting rewards. I deserve this. But do you see the sin in that? My deeds, my works, my faithfulness, my rewards. And there's the danger of the eldest son. It's self-righteousness. Look at me. Look at what I've done. Do you realize what the the, the self-righteous do, what the elder brothers do? Is our goodness, our righteousness is determined relative to other people's lack of righteousness. I am righteous because you're not. The elder brother looks more righteous than the younger brother, so therefore I am righteous. I deserve more. The problem is we're playing the wrong game of relativity. If you want to know your righteousness, do not compare it to Hitler. Be like, I'm a pretty good dude compared to Hitler. If you want to play the righteousness relativity game, compare your righteousness to the holiness and majesty of Almighty God and then see how you're doing. That's where the comparison is. And all of us, younger brothers and older brothers, we all fall short of the glory of God. And that's our danger. This story is imploring us, whether we're the older brother or the younger brother, both of them are lost. Both come home and realize your position in my kingdom. God wants to celebrate. Heaven is waiting to celebrate you. There's a picture I want to pull up that I ran across years ago. Um, I think, yeah, this is, I, I'm not a Chicago Cubs fan, but this is incredible when you think about this. This guy's just walk, hit a home run, a walk-off home run. He's rounding third base. There's his teammates waiting to celebrate with him at home plate. That's the church. When a sinner comes home, when a sinner comes home and says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and you're humble and you're repentant, and here's all of your people waiting to celebrate and your father waiting to celebrate with you. They're not there to judge you. They're not there to hurt you or condemn you. The Pharisees are off the side. They've been kicked out of the game. This is, this is what's waiting for you. And then behind them are all the fans. This is the crowd of heaven celebrating as all the angels rejoice because that which was lost, that which was dead, has come home. Has come home. You can close that, please. Interesting thing to note as we close. We know what the younger son decided. We know what the prodigal did. He repented, he came home. Isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't tell us what the elder brother decided? It ends with the father confronting the, young, or the older brother and saying, all of this is yours, man. What are you talking about? This has always been yours. Celebrate. You're welcome to come to the table as my son. Come inside, let's celebrate your brother. And we don't know what the elder brother chooses. It's open-ended for us, the audience. What are we going to do with Jesus' message? So this morning, again, we did this whole series for this moment. Let's start with the self-righteous. You remember being that kid, even if you were 40 years old or 50 years old when you came to Christ. And over time, self-righteousness has worked its way in. I deserve this. I, I, I. The Father's saying, come home. It's not about you, it's about me. It's about my love, it's about my grace. Then to those of you guys that are in the pig pen right now, I'm telling you from from this pulpit, there's zero judgment and so much prayer that has gone into this for you today. Because I know where you're at. And I know the wrestling match going on in your heart. And I know there's pride in there and it's like, man, If I repent, it it could be shameful, it could be embarrassing, but I want you to see there's a heavenly father on the stoop waiting, waiting for you to make that first step. You make that first step, he's coming lunging after you. He's just waiting. Your invitation this morning is come home. Come home to Christ, the one who has given his life for your sins. Past, present, future, everything you've ever done, everything you will ever do, the stuff you're stuck in right now, he's ready to cleanse you, put a robe on you, put a ring on you, put shoes on you, and celebrate you. But you've got to come to yourself. You've got to be like, I'm at the end of my rope. I need to come home. Will you bow your heads with me? Right now, in this moment, I, I, I truly hope God is doing something in your hearts. <laughs> For those that are, have the elder brother syndrome, just judgmental and defiant and self-righteous, 
this morning. I pray God would humble us and allow us to see our relationship with him the way he sees it and our relationship with the lost the way he wants us to see it. And then for those of you guys, listen to me, please. Those of you guys that are stuck in the pit, you're in the pig pit right now. My prayer for you is that in this moment you would see the beauty of the cross, you would see the beauty of what God has done for you and what he's calling you to. It's not a mistake you're here today. God is calling you from that. You don't have to remain there. You don't have to live in that. You don't have to live in the shame or the defiance anymore. He's welcoming you home. But you gotta respond. Say, Jesus, this is me. Listen, I'm not gonna make anybody stand up today. I'm not gonna make anybody come forward. I want this to be a moment between you and God. But if that's you this morning, here's what I'm gonna need you to do. Today, after this service, come see me, come see somebody you trust, a family member, somebody in the church, and say, this is me. This is, I, I, I'm in the pit. This is exactly where I'm at. I'm in the pit. And I wanna come home. So pray this prayer with me. Jesus, this morning, I give you my life. I've run from you. I've done everything in my power to live on my own, to do it my way, and I have failed magnificently. At times, it looked like I had it all together. But God, I can't trick you. You know my heart. You know the thoughts I have when I lay my head on my pillow at night. You know the anger. You know the shame. You know the confusion. And God, if this is true, then I want to come home to you. I want to come home to the arms of an everlasting father. And the way to that is through Jesus Christ, by putting my faith in him, my trust in him. Jesus, because of your cross, I can come to you boldly and ask you, please cleanse me of my sin. I repent of all my sin to you. I have done things my way, and I want to surrender to you as Savior and Lord today. I want to come home. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your faithfulness, for what you've done for us. We thank you for your compassion, Heavenly Father, the way that you loved us and treated us, that you have purpose for us.